Hello there. So the state pension is under threat again, and at the rate our politicians are destroying our economy, it might disappear altogether. Whether you be young or old, this should concern you. Because the state pension triple lock is back in the spotlight again, and it will affect anyone who either collects their pension today or will receive it later in life, even if that point is decades away. The triple lock is there to ensure that the state pension increases in real terms over time. But it seems that our political masters have other ideas. They want to spend that money on other things. Rumour is abounding that the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, will somehow tinker with the triple lock to prevent state pensioners benefiting from the full rise due to them under its provisions. Because the increase in payout next year will be very high, with wages having increased by 8.5%. The triple lock that was put in place in 2011 by the Tory Lib Dem coalition sets out that the state pension will rise by the rate of inflation, the rate of wage rises, including bonuses, or 2.5%, whichever is the highest. And it was put in place to gradually, over time, ensure the state pension was worth more in real terms so as to start bringing it into line with other developed countries' pension arrangements, which are much better than ours. And once we're there, we can then cut back on the triple lock. Because if left in place forever, it would be unaffordable, and that's why people claim it is unsustainable. But it is also unsustainable if we have a low worker-to-pensioner ratio with the only answer to that being to raise the retirement age into the future as we have been doing. And with our low birth rate, we are being urged to accept a high level of inward migration to provide workers. And no one's looking at productivity, just more workers. Anyway, ensuring the triple lock stays in place now until parity with other nation-state pensions is achieved, will actually help the younger generations retire in the future. But for some reason there is a move out there to try and make out that the young today are paying more for the elderly, but somehow won't benefit themselves in the long run. They are trying to divide the young and the old. And I see this as a tactic being used probably by a nudge unit, while the government flies a kite about giving pensioners a smaller rise next year. With a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, saying the triple lock should be temporarily cut. To fund tax cuts. But any cut to the triple lock, as happened once during the pandemic, will obviously be a drag on the future growth of pension payouts. If we really want the state pension to grow, then the triple lock must stay until such time that the payments are at the level the nation wants them. Now there is talk that the Chancellor will remove the bonus element from the wages part of the triple lock, and that would reduce the increase slightly to 7.8% or that he will delay the decision until average wage rises decrease. Now, according to the IFS, the state pension is worth 11% more today than it would have been without the triple lock. But this has come at a cost. The triple lock is now costing the taxpayer an extra 11 billion quid a year. And if pensioners get the full rise next year, it will cost another £2 billion on top of that. And in the last financial year, 2022 to 2023, the total cost was £112.5 billion. But it's not all bad news for the Treasury. Because of the tax thresholds not being raised, the taxman will take back one in every seven of those extra pounds given out. Now, the Tory party did pledge in their last manifesto that they would maintain the triple lock, but they have already broken that promise once. 
Now, what may surprise some people is that Labour's Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner have both failed to defend the triple lock. Some people do need to realise that we have a uniparty blob where fake party politics always ends up moving in the same general direction. And former Tory leader William Hague said that the triple lock was unsustainable and couldn't go on forever. Well, we know that. The point is to increase it gradually until it's at a nationally agreed suitable level. And he also said that if left in place until 2050, an IFS report says it would cost another 45 billion quid. A runaway train is a fair analogy, because we don't know where it will end up or at what speed. It's nearly going too fast already for the train drivers to slow it down. But if they don't, it will end in disaster, he wrote in the Times. Adding interestingly that the train drivers, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer, understand this. Neither can afford to commit electoral suicide by being alone in suggesting that some change is needed, even though that is obvious. Sometimes in politics, you have to help each other a bit. We are being prepped to see Labour and the Tories agree to cut back on the triple lock. We're being nudged into accepting stagnation in our state pension growth. All because we have too many international obligations to pay for. And those come first. Like the record 1.6 billion quid of our money that Rishi Sunak at the G20 summit committed to the Green Climate Fund. And they might need it to fund the HQ and the 220 people in it. Then there's foreign aid and the amount of money being spent on housing so many newcomers in the UK. At least that cost is coming out of the foreign aid budget. But there are some politicians who want it coming out of the Home Office budget, so as to keep the flow of DOSH going out of the country at a maximum. Anyway, at PMQs today, the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, did not ask the PM any questions about the triple lock. It's all over the press, so why didn't he ask? Presumably because his deputy, Angela Rayner, had publicly failed to say that Labour would keep it. In the past, this subject would have been an open-door question to put to the Prime Minister. And when quizzed on it by the leader of the SNP in Westminster, Stephen Flynn, the PM could not quite bring himself to give an unequivocal yes to keeping the triple lock as is. So I fear that it will be watered down. Now, as an aside, one Scottish Lib Dem MP, Christine Jardine, asked this. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much. As the, I thank the Minister for his answer. And he will know that, like his constituents, yeah. my constituents in Edinburgh West still face the impact of food inflation, higher energy bills and unfair standing charges for electricity. But we also now face the potential bombshell of a council tax hike by the Scottish <laughs> Government, which will affect 14,500 households in Edinburgh West who will have to pay more than £2,000 a year. So will the UK Government be speaking to the Scottish Government, if you don't mind, will the UK Government be speaking to the Scottish Government to try to mitigate this and what steps do they have in mind to support it? Mr Speaker, I share the Honourable Lady's concern. Mitigation? What is she asking for? For more Westminster funding to be given out to Scotland, perhaps? That would be the people of the rest of the UK, actually England, paying these increased Scottish taxes by proxy. You do have to wonder about some of these MPs. The whole point of Scotland having the power to raise its own taxes is so that the rest of us don't have to pay for SNP socialist and green follies. They already get a hugely generous chunk of cash from the rest of us. And what's going to happen when the North Sea investment dries up due to green zealotry, together with Tory and Labour North Sea oil and gas profit tax policies? 
I suppose they could always tax the wind and solar power companies more in future to make up the difference. Exactly like the taxes that will be piled on electric vehicles moving forwards.